Hey there, everybody. Welcome back to another awesome episode of On the Throttle with Jackie Van Hammond. My buddy Josh Truck out here bringing you all the breaking news going on out here in motorcycles and power sports. Welcome back, everybody. Our brand new New Year, first episode of 2024. Josh and I are going to be talking about some breaking news going on out here in motorcycle land. And we've got a great trailer for a brand spanking new web series here at MPN called Two Wheels two ways we're going to have that feature we had that little trailer in the middle of today's program for my stories for today i'm going to be talking about the folks over at ktm their numbers are up but their job numbers are down or are they and i'm going to be talking about one of my most favorite times of the year and that is dakar rally is kicking off here in the next handful of days as well as ama supercross josh what you got going on in your neck of the woods um, we are going to dive into the periodic table, so go ahead and get out your seventh grade <laughs> chemistry book. And then we are also going to talk about how to do dumb things with motorcycles and get trophies for it. So that, those are the two topics I'm going to talk about today. Um, I'm already nervous. I feel like there might be a quiz be. during today's program from you. Uh, we're all going to have to wait and see what on earth Josh is talking about after this word from our sponsor. Welcome back, everybody. Periodic table of elements. Josh, are you trying to give me a heart attack out here? Yes, that's exactly <laughs> I have PTSD it. From, PTSD from eighth grade. You're triggering me right now. Anywho, let's get into my very first story for today. This, Speaking of triggering, this has been burning down the internet a little bit in the last handful of days because nothing kicks the hornet's nest out here on the interwebs like when big motorcycle companies start announcing that they're moving production overseas. And that is the, what I'm going to be talking about for my first story for today. Today, and that is indeed the folks at KTM are relocating a very good chunk of their production from Austria over to China. Let's go ahead and jump on into today's story. The Perrier Mobility Group, uh, also known as the parent company of KTM, is relocating a good chunk of their production over to China. After acquiring the Austrian brand KTM, Perrier Mobility Group has become Europe's number one motorized two-wheeler manufacturer with 190,293 bikes sold in the first half of 2023 with an increase in sales volume of 16.5% compared to the same period in 2022. Oh my gosh, 16.5% growth? Yeah. Um, Perry Mobility Group is determined to further increase its position. I, I don't, I, I mean, I thought that was pretty good, but they're they're going for gold out here. They're looking to further increase their position by relocating some uh, is vol volume and sales position for 2024. And as a result, top corporate management has decided to sell the R Raymond and Felt Bicycle brands, which are part of the superior group while promoting the production of Husqvarna and gas gas e-bikes. Not a huge surprise there, but the decision was made to further concentrate activity on the four motorcycle brands that make up the group, KTM, gas gas, Husqvarna, and MV Augusta. In addition, Perrier Mobility Group will cut 300 jobs at its factories in Austria and transfer production to its partnerships in India with Bajaj and in China with CF Moto. The relocation will also include some R&D research and development activities. The move is based on a rigorous analysis of the economic and financial situation in Europe, with 2024 showing a co contraction compared to 23, especially since the European Central Bank has confirmed that it will keep interest rates at the current level. The situation has already forced the group to reduce its dealer network in order to make it more efficient. Due to its solid liquidity situation, the group has helped a number of dealers to reduce the burden of high bank fees, and it's also helped some suppliers who are facing financial problems. This was possible thanks to the group's solid liquidity position. As I mentioned, the board of directors therefore took the decision to strengthen the core business, making 2024 a year of consolidation. On the other hand, the decision to relocate part of the production activity in China, to, or relocate part of the production activity to Austria seemed logical given the fact that cooperation with CF Moto appears to be very positive to the extent that production of the 790 Duke and 790 Adventure medium cylinder models has already been re relocated to China. This not only takes advantage of lower production costs, but also strengthens KTM's image in the Far East market, market which continues to grow faster than any other. So here's what's going on. So CF Moto, or, I'm sorry, 
Perio Mobility, who's the parent group, as I just mentioned, and we just talked about in depth of KTM, has decided to strengthen its position, aka increase its margins, by moving a big chunk of its production over to China. They are still going to be keeping some of their flagship models at the KTM headquarters in Austria, but a very large part of it is going to be heading over there. Not too surprised because a handful of their top sellers already are based out of China already. So the quality control is already there. Some of their best models are already being made in China. So this is not a reason for the sky is falling. However, the internet does get a little stirred up when they hear about this kind of news. And there's an awful lot of unhappy people out here already, even though nothing has even happened yet. Josh, what do you think about this story? Um, there was there's there was a time when Asian bikes um, were considered terrible and trash and horrible and just no one wanted them. And that was in the 60s. And that is now Honda, Yamaha, Suzuki, Kawasaki. So look, we've been here before. Um, another, I, I see this as kind of another pivot and another reinvention for the industry. Now, hopefully, this turns out as a good thing as it did back then because we got a whole slew of new bikes a whole i mean a whole different way of looking at motorcycling when the asian the asian invasion of motorcycles happened before so is this another iteration of that i have heard a lot of talk of that the thing that i i agree with you the internet is absolutely burning down on this because you know Everyone loves to speculate on everything. To me, we need to wait and see what we get. I think this could be very, very good. There's other implications with it, but I can't blame KTM for wanting to do this. So that all being said, there's some great stuff. When you look at Kove, when you look at what CF Moto is releasing, there's some good stuff coming out of China, as much as a lot of people don't want to admit it. We are in for interesting times. I hope they're good. We are in for inter interesting times for sure. And as you already touched on, there is a handful of very, very good manufacturers and really brilliant bikes coming out of China right now. Um, yep. KTM would not have had this partnership. Perry Mobility would not have had this partnership without having very, very good quality control behind it. Yeah. The other thing that I think is really interesting is to think about it as at the back end of this press release is they did touch on the fact that European market is expected to have a bit of a contraction, even though 16% growth in 2023 Yes. doesn't make me feel like a contraction is coming. However, they are anticipating that. So their biggest yeah. growth segment potentially lays in Asia. So it does make a lot more sense for tax purposes yep. as well as labor purposes to go ahead and move the bikes that are probably going to sell the most and the best in those markets over to their home turf. So that's my very first story for today. Josh, what you got going on for your first story? So in 2022, Kawasaki showed basically some drawings of this motorcycle and they're like, hey, um, this could be the future here. And then it was announced that they are part of the HYSE project. I believe Yamaha is in that, Suzuki's in that, and it's, it's in conjunction with Toyota exploring hydrogen as a fuel, which is H2. Kawasaki, do they have something else that's related to H2? Ah, uh, hmm. I wonder what I wonder what that would be. So there is actually a a genuine prototype that is available like this. Well, it's not available like this, but it is out there like this. Yes. It has been seen on floors. Um, no one, I believe, has seen it rolling any place other than but under hand power. But this is it is. From what everyone's saying, this is a modified Ninja H2 SX, not a Ninja 1000 as it was thought at every place before. One of the details of why we're looking at this shot that I thought was interesting was the uh, daytime running light is an H. I found that pretty interesting. Um, this <laughs> is a supercharged four-cylinder like the existing H2. It is modified for hydrogen. It's direct injected. There's a supercharger. Um, with stuff like hydrogen, you essentially need a supercharger in order to get enough air in there in order to make enough power. It, hydrogen runs very lean, so you've got to get a ton of air in there to get the right fuel to air ratio requirements. Um, there's no performance numbers yet. Of course, this is a prototype. Engine is still under development. Um, now, what's interesting is I know you're going to be talking about this later, Jackie, is Dakar, their Kawasaki's X1 side-by-side, 
is running hydrogen as part of that. So it'll mm -hmm. be interesting to see how this happens. Um, the motorcycle is expected to be tested soon after the Dakar rally. Something that's interesting about this is obviously the, the H2 branding there. I mean, who knows what mm -hmm. they do with the other H2 at that point. Um, there's a modified front fairing. Those are not giant saddlebags back there. Those are fuel tanks or hydrogen mm -hmm. tanks, however you want to put that. Um, they replace the luggage. They also replace any pillion seats. So this is meant for bachelors or motorcycle bachelors, as we will call them. Um, there are some pretty <laughs> unclear details in terms of how it will get refueled. Um, there's a lot of speculation because there's, I mean, Hydrogen fueling stations are not that abundant yet. Um, there's a lot of speculations that these will be swappable tanks. Um, I find that yeah. kind of interesting. Filling up hydrogen mm -hmm. is, I don't want to say a risky proposition, but it's not an easy one. Um, the canister system, system they're saying is more likely. Um, what I find so interesting about this is that this shows that Kawasaki is seriously exploring this. We're looking at all sorts of different things here. Range has been solved on the electric side of things for cars in most cases because weight is not as much of an issue. With a motorcycle, weight is a huge issue. So we run into mm -hmm. these range issues and everything like that. So seeing this is kind of interesting. I, I'm wondering how this is going to turn out. I'm wondering what the test results are going to show. To me, I, my worry is, is that we end up with a 700 pound, 100, uh, 700 pound, 100 horsepower motorcycle. Um, we've obviously got to test some reliability. The other thing that I see with this too, is we are adding once again, this, this still uses internal combustion. So we have mm -hmm. all these moving parts. We have all these things to manage. Whereas electrics, you've got a stator. Um, so it's, it's, it's interesting to see what's going to happen with this. Um, I'm glad that they're exploring this, but time will tell. Are you going to be, uh, fueling up at the hydrogen station and plugging in and hoping that you don't get a leak and, well, as as with a lot of <laughs> news, out, uh, as with a lot of news out here in motorcycle power sports land, Josh, you and I are. I'm sorry, I have brought this story to this program for the last handful of years because this project has been in the works, as you mentioned, since yep. 2022. I saw their very first prototype at ICMA that year. Now, now fast forward to where we are today. So this bike has been tweaked. It does look a little different from what they were showing at ICMA. Yeah. But at that same time, 2020, 2021, there was a huge investment from not only, as you've talked about, this kind of like uh, power group of, of manufacturers yeah. that are trying to come together and really explore hydrogen really in a real way. There also was a huge, huge, huge investment by Bosch looking into hydrogen as a sustainable, usable energy source as well. And when I say huge, I mean, it was like 150 million or something crazy like that yep. just for North America. So hydrogen is real it is on it is the lips of an awful lot of manufacturers because it is so plentiful and it has such low um, emissions impact low carbon impact low low environmental impact as it were so it actually I think this is doesn't really though um, how do you mean because when you when you look at how they get the hydrogen the chemical reactions involved in that in a lot of cases and the energy it takes to get that are not always necessarily carbon intensive, but energy intensive. So it's it, what I what's interesting about this is it's this weird balancing act of who's going to get to the finish line first, and that's oh, yeah, what's going to be interesting mean, about it. Yeah, I don't mean to imply that this is zero. This is absolutely yeah. not a zero proposition. But I mean, it takes a ton of energy to get to get yeah. dead dinosaur juice out of the ground. It takes a ton of energy to make batteries and then ship yes. them over from Asia. Like I get it, but yep. this is a very viable source. I think it's really, sure. really fascinating. Um, and I mean, I'm here for it. I can't wait to see where this goes. I can't wait to see what happens with it. I think it's really, really interesting. Gonna be and interesting. we are seeing uh, we are seeing slowly a handful more filling stations because we're also seeing hydrogen powered cars, which as you and I know, so, it has to start at the automotive side first and then it trickles down down here to right. power sports and motorcycles. That's just how the how the chain of command works, man. I can't change it. I can't do anything about it. That's how it goes. So 
Thank you for that awesome story. I love that little little bit of new news going on over in Hydrogen Land. Oh, yeah. And you're right, I did see a little mention also in my Dakar story. So we'll be jumping into that here in just one second. But first, we have got another great trailer from a web series that we are going to be kicking off here. Actually, this month, it's coming up right now. We're in 2024 already. It's called Two Wheels, Two Waves, Two Ways. And it's about a great adventure, a, a road trip with me and my good buddy, Patrick, going from the middle part of America out to Las Vegas in celebration and anticipation of this year's 2024 AIM Expo. We've got a word from our sponsor and then we're going to roll that trailer. Stay tuned. Clunky DMS software at work and beautiful software in your personal life? Check out Black Pearl at blackpearl.com, a game changer designed for modern dealers. Simplify your operations with Black Pearl. Don't let outdated DMS technology hold your business back. I'm Jackie Van Ham. I've been around the country and around the planet writing about, talking about, reporting on, and being a part of the world of motorcycles and power sports. When my friend Patrick contacted me to see if I wanted to ride the 2,000 miles to attend the 2024 AIM Expo, how could I say no? Together, we'll explore motorcycle and power sports culture and meet some amazing people along the way. Join us on this incredible adventure as we ride to AIM Expo on two wheels, two ways. about that josh does that look like a good time oh For my sure. gosh we had we had such a ball shooting this and it was so fantastic to run into familiar faces and make new friends and meet new people out here in the world of motorcycling and power sports we stopped by some incredible dealerships um we had great adventures we rode side by sides we did tons of cool stuff so y'all are gonna have to make sure you stay tuned and hit that notifications on hit that like hit that subscribe do the things do the stuff because you're not gonna want to miss any of those episodes that are kicking off here in the next week weekish handful of weeks some sometime soon january now so that's what's going on for mpn brand new project talking about new things going on over here though my second story for today it is one of my most i feel like i say this a lot it's one of my most favorite times of the year because it is da car season that is right dakar is right around the corner it kicks off from the fifth sixth is technically the launch all the way through the 19th of january it is over in saudi arabia which it has been for the last handful of years there's a map on your screen right now you can see this super rowdy path that they are going to cut over the course of those uh over over those days um and you can see all the different stages going on as well let's go ahead and jump into this story the fifth edition of the Dakar in Saudi Arabia promises to push man and woman, come on now, man and woman and machine harder than any of the previous ones. After the first week in which the competitors will feel the heat from the start in Alula, the field will take, will tackle an empty quarter triptych, including a brand new concept, a 48 hour chrono uh, timed stage held over two days in which the competitors scattered amongst eight bivouacs will be basically left to their own devices. The rest day in Riyadh will only provide a brief respite as the varied terrain between that point and the finish in Yambu is riddled with navigational challenges that could shift the balance of power at any time. A few things left the field of the da few things left the field of the Dakar as awestruck as Alula and its region when the race first landed in Saudi Arabia in January of 2022. The kaleidoscope landscapes of the great outdoors blend with the weight of history and an element of mystery and a humbling experience and an invitation to contemplation. Look at that. All the folks at Dakar are a bunch of poets and they don't know it. Um, the 48-hour stage that I just mentioned a hot second ago, this is a new stage format contested over two days with the constraints of a marathon stage, although competitors are permitted to help each other during the evening. But this time, there will be no chance of canteen or repair companions as the drivers and crews will be spread out over eight different bivouacs. When the clock strikes 4 p.m., 
All vehicles will be required to stop at the next bivouac they come across. With no connection and therefore no visibility of their rivals' performances, the competitors will camp out and set off again at 7 a.m. the following day to complete the remaining section of the route. The tally will be counted after around 600 kilometers of the special stage. So that is what's going on for the folks over at Dakar. As I mentioned, it kicks off officially on the 5th and 6th of January. It ends officially Friday the 19th of January. Make sure you follow along over at all of the Dakar websites. I'm sure that they will also be streaming. There'll be all sorts of opportunities to watch some of this incredible footage. This is one of my most favorite, favorite, favorite race events of the year. The stories are bottomless. The inspiration is boundless. It is just absolutely phenomenal. And everything under the sun ends up racing. It is motorcycles, it is quads, it is trucks, it is classics. It is a specialty like hopped up, hopped up super duper high performance cars and trucks. It is all sorts of neat stuff going on. That's what's going on right now. And then on the back end of the story, it is also one of my favorite times of year. And that is the kickoff of the AMA Supercross season. A1 is coming up right around the bend, which of course, to all of you Supercross nerds know that that is Anaheim. A1 is going to be Saturday, February 3rd. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Saturday, January 6th is AMA Supercross at Anaheim, the first round. I will be definitely tuned into that because as Josh and I talk about on the show, that is going to be the kickoff for the brand spanking new Triumph Motorcycle race team as well. Josh, what do you got to say about all this exciting racing going on here in the next week? Triumph came out with a dirt bike. No, um, so the, the, <laughs> the, the big thing that I will say, yeah. So, so uh, if you want to watch Dakar, um, Mav TV carries uh, same day broadcast of it. Um, you can get it through Hulu Live. Um, you can also get it through YouTube TV. You can get Mav TV. Um, Spectrum and Direct TV also carry it. NBC Sports will be broadcasting highlights on Peacock. And then there's also cover to cover racing on flow racing and daily recaps on Red Bull TV. So those yeah. are all places that I will have up on multiple screens at the same time, probably in multiple languages. Um, but yeah, that's I mean, it's a great race, great stories. There's all sorts of great stuff that comes out of it. Um, excited to see it. And yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm here for it. Yeah, you and I both are. I'm, I'm really excited. This is, like yeah. I said, this is one of my favorite times of year. Earlier before we kicked off the show, Josh was like, it's kind of a slow news week. And I'm like, no way, man. January is bananas. <laughs> there is all sorts of good stuff going on, particularly if you were uh, one of us race nerds out here. All right, Josh, what you got going on for your second story? Speaking of race nerds, um, there was recently the uh, the S1 GP schedule was, was released. And I mean, if you're like me, and you want to drag knees, but in the same sense, you also like to jump over things. Um, S1GP <laughs> is where that happens. So their schedule just came out. It was released um, uh, 21st of April. They will be in Spain the 26th of May. They will be in Italy um, the 30th of June. They will be in uh, uh, Piemonte. There's Poland on the 21st of July. Germany in August. Um, the GP of Romania is on the 8th of September. Um, the 6th of October is Belgium. And this year on the 29th of September, France will be hosting the Supermoto of Nations. Um, okay. Yes, what you see here is in the same race. The Supermoto of Nations is very similar to Motocross as Nations. Um, you go not representing your team, but you go representing your country. So no matter what factory team you race for, you're racing for your country. And the way they do it is I believe there's uh, uh, three to five racers for each team and points are awarded for placing. The first place gets one point, 10th place gets 10 points. I'm assuming you guys can do the math in between there. Um, the lowest, the team with the lowest number of points at the end of the race weekend obviously wins. It's a unique event and that team, obviously the country gets to take home the trophy. It's, it's a pretty big deal. It's a lot of fun. You see a lot of guys that normally go head to head with each other are working on the same team. So it's highly entertaining. Um, this year, I'm always excited. Unfortunately, I have to wait till April for the first race, but I believe watching the Supercross on uh, coming up here next week, I that will be enough to tide me over. 
Um, cause you know, there's, there's some super cross stuff here. So that, yeah, that'll be enough to tide me over. <laughs> I, I, I'm assuming that, I mean, the, this, I'm assuming you're in the same boat I am Jackie, especially, I mean, right now it's cold. I will still go for a ride, but there's fewer days where I'm thinking, yeah, I want to go for a ride. So having <laughs> this type of racing coming up and on the TV makes it like, do I want to go for a ride or, oh, Hey, Supercross is on. I am going to go ride the couch. <laughs> <laughs> You're not wrong. January is my favorite time of year for a handful of things, including uh, buckling up uh, into the couch with a pizza and watching some Supercross. Yeah. I do have to admit that that is one of my favorite pastimes here in January while it is gray yeah. and gloomy and cold. So, yeah, I love this time Good of year time for to those do two it. races. Uh, it's great storytelling. It's very inspirational. I, yes. I, I just really, really thoroughly enjoy it this time of year as far as supermoto uh your supermoto series is anybody streaming that is anybody playing that how can, how can you watch that i've i've looked and you can watch it through if you get some european sponsorships and then you have or european channels and you have to do it through a vpn um they okay. typically release the races about a month and a half after the race on their YouTube channel. So we, uh, I, I will occasionally save one or two of those for the winter also. Um, yeah. I find out who wins so I can keep up with it, but then, yeah. So, and Lucas Holbacher is not with KTM. The world's fastest baker is not with KTM this year. So it's going to be interesting. It's going to be interesting, and we're all going to have to wait and see what happens. Some exciting we racing are. kicking off already at the very beginning of yep. January. Well, that's another great yep. episode, folks. Thank you so much for tuning in every single week. Thank you for watching. If you're brand new to the program, welcome. Welcome. Don't forget to hit that like and subscribe button because we've got more awesome stuff coming your way. And if there's ever breaking news out here, you know Josh not going to be, be the ones bringing it to you. You're not going to want to miss it. Have a great day, everybody, and we will see you next week.